Lady Diana Cooper was a woman who defied convention and captivated high society with her beauty, wit, and unyielding spirit. From her rumored parentage and childhood experiments in necromancy to her flamboyant adolescence and tumultuous romance with Duff Cooper, Diana's life was a whirlwind of passion, resilience, and rebellion. Experience her dramatic transformation from a debutante disillusioned by societal expectations to a trailblazing actress and devoted wife. Discover how she navigated the opulence of Belvoir Castle, the perils of World War I, and the glittering allure of New York's theater scene. Feel the heartbreak of losing dear friends, the exhilaration of secret love, and the ultimate sorrow of losing her husband. This is the tale of a woman who lived life on her own terms, leaving an indelible mark on history. Join us this week as we look at the life of Lady Diana Cooper. Born in 1892, Diana Manners was the youngest child of the Duke and Duchess of Rutland, though whispers suggested her biological father was the charismatic Harry Cust. Diana once confided to a friend, I find solace in Tom Jones on Bastards and delight in seeing myself as a living monument of incontinence. Reflecting on Cust, she recalled, very beautiful I thought him, and admitted, he was a man I loved with all my heart. Diana's mother, Violet, was a marvel of beauty and talent. Renowned stage actress, Mrs. Patrick Campbell, declared Violet the most beautiful thing I ever saw. Violet harbored grand notions of Diana marrying Edward, Prince of Wales, but Diana's heart was unyielding, and the prince favored sophisticated, worldly women. Nevertheless, the Manners family commanded vast estates, including the magnificent Belvoir Castle, and Diana thrived in this enchanting environment. At the tender age of 10, she faced the shadow of death from the rare herbs disease. She confronted her illness with a stoicism and bravery that belied her years. Her mother, however, remained oblivious to Diana's internal struggles with illness and depression, dismissing them as unbecoming of English dignity. This period of illness and recovery likely shaped Diana's character, instilling in her a resilience and fortitude that would define much of her later life. Diana had a creative mind. She filled her room with bottles for elixiral experiments, imagining herself a necromancer. As she approached 14, Diana blossomed into a spirited teenager. She showed off madly, even bleaching her hair silvery gold. I wanted first to be loved, and next I wanted to be clever, she recalled. Though her knowledge had gaps from an education that focused on poetry, embroidering, and singing, her mind teemed with ideas. One evening, during an after-dinner game, she impatiently snapped at a player. Use your brain, Mr. Balfour. Use your brain. Balfour was a former prime minister. She was 15. Diana's yearning for sophistication led her to admire uncorseted female models and sophisticated French society, inspired by visits from the playwright Henri Bernstein and Princess Murat. In 1908, Violet took Diana to see Maud Allen's erotic performance of The Vision of Salome. The performance's blatant sensuality, including Allen's climactic scene with John the Baptist's severed head, made a lasting impression. Her coming out in 1910 was muted by King Edward's death. Most debutantes were raw, shy girls, and the young men seemed awkward and insipid, and Diana found it all rather tedious. Instead, she embraced the modern world, frequenting nightclubs like the Cave of the Golden Calf, where she danced to ragtime and reveled in new freedoms. Diana's antics and cultivated naughtiness made her a notorious figure in the corrupt coterie, a group of young aristocrats who embraced decadence and rebellion. During this period, she first met Duff Cooper, who was struck by her beauty and wit and fell deeply in love with her. Diana, however, while admiring Duff and finding him a good friend, originally didn't share his feelings. The tragic deaths of two members of her circle, Gustav Hamel and Dennis Anson, in 1914 brought criticism. Gustav, in order to impress Diana, would perform daredevil stunts in his plane. After the crash, the media scapegoated Diana. She faced social rejection for the first time. Her mother, anxious about Diana's prospects, pressured her to marry well. Cocooned in her world of social gatherings and personal indulgences, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in June 1914 had barely registered in her sphere. But as the war drew closer, her first instinct as war loomed was to volunteer as a nurse in a Red Cross field hospital near the front lines. 
Sentimentally, she cherished the idea of being close to her male friends, already signing up for officer training. However, her mother, Violet, was adamant in her refusal, convinced that her daughter would end up raped and left for dead by drunken soldiers, or at the very least, working in appalling conditions. But Diana was unyielding. In October 1914, angry, stubborn, and emotionally exhausted from arguing, she embarked on her new life at Guy's Hospital in London. From six in the morning, when the light bulb above her bed was automatically switched on, to 10.15 at night, she obeyed the orders of professional nurses who patrolled the clattering, sterile wards. No allowances were made for her lack of experience as she disinfected surgical trays and handled bedpans. Thrust straight into the stink and gore of medical emergencies, Diana faced patients whose suffering was beyond her initial comprehension. She had tried to prepare herself by watching a hair being eviscerated in the kitchen, but nothing minimized the trauma of her first patients. A woman who'd had a cancerous tumor sliced out of her chin, another with a post-operative wound in her side, from which a stream of green pus oozed slowly. She grew close to some fellow nurses and was grateful to be included in their late-night dormy feasts. The novelty of sharing cigarettes and sweets, of enjoying suppressed songs and laughter, made her poignantly aware of her restricted upbringing, of all the larks I had missed by never being a schoolgirl. Diana prided herself on her stoicism, never taking a day off work, except when seriously ill, never fainting during an operation, and no longer needing to turn away from repulsive things. When she was off duty, she spent time with her friends, who took her out for taxi rides in the park or for dinner in the one restaurant in Southwark they considered decent. Women's lives were changing, both for volunteers like her and for the new female workforce tackling jobs left vacant by enlisting soldiers. By the end of the war, nearly two million women had proved themselves as bus drivers, glaziers, bank clerks and cashiers, motorcycle couriers, railway porters, tree cutters, farmers, stage managers, librarians, engineers, policewomen and teachers. Raymond Asquith, one of Diana's dearest friends, was transferred to the front in the spring of 1916. Their bond deepened into something like love, though remained chaste. Yet, in the destabilizing atmosphere of war, restraint was hard to maintain. They met in a local inn before Raymond's departure, sharing a passionate yet non-consummated moment. Diana's love for Raymond made her feel closer to his wife, Catherine, and they shared a desperate needle of morphine on the night Raymond was transferred to France. On September 15, 1916, Raymond was shot on the battlefield of the Somme. Diana's pain was excruciating. My brain is revolving so fast, screaming, Raymond killed, my divine Raymond killed, over and over again. The loss was unendurable. Misery settled into her like a toxin, preventing sleep or concentration on work. Her friend Duff, also deeply in love with her, tried to console her. When she told him, I love you most among the living, he grew cold and distanced himself from her. In June 1917, Duff faced conscription. The fear of losing him blotted out her lingering grief for Raymond. Schooled in the nightmare calculations of war, she began to count the time they had left together. Diana had a full nine months grace before Duff was dispatched to the front. In April, after he marched to Waterloo Station, she bravely wrote to him of her complete love. The war had become a blind, murderous treadmill. A generation was laid waste for a cause few understood. One by one, the lovely, clever boys with whom Diana had danced, flirted, and read poetry were dispatched to the front, and one by one, they perished. In September 1917, Diana arrived at Arlington Street to find all the windows blown out and a crater the size of half a tennis court 10 yards away in the park. Early in the war, when Diana and her friends heard the bombs, they calmly filled their glasses and toasted to the sound of the guns continuing their evening with an air of nonchalance. But by May 1918, all laughing had stopped. The blackout darkened streets had become home to all kinds of thieving and vicing, and Diana and the other girls found walking alone dangerous. By January 1918, Edward Horner and Patrick Shaw Stewart, two of her last surviving officer friends, had perished. During this time, Duff Cooper became her closest friend and confidant but even their correspondence had become erratic. 
Even when letters came, the censor's deletions left her imagining unspoken horrors. Work was her only relief. The exhaustion shut down her imagination, and the suffering of her patients put her own agony in perspective. She had to treat severely burned children using the then accepted method of pouring hot melted wax over their raw wounds. The children's pitiful screams haunted her, but it was then, Diana wrote, that she learned not to cry. Diana lived tentatively from day to day, now convinced that when the war ended, she wanted to be with Duff. The Duchess observed the growing intimacy between Diana and Duff with alarm. She feared Duff's reputation for drink and women and his lack of fortune. However, Diana had changed. British society had changed too. She framed a virtuous picture of their future lives. She even considered launching an aviation passenger business with the backing of Max Beaverbrook. Despite all odds, Duff survived. In early October, he was awarded a DSO for his courage in battle and was back in London and in her arms. It was a rapturous reunion. All that I had hoped of happiness for the last six months came true, wrote Duff in his diary. On the evening of Armistice Day, as she and Duff sat together mourning their friends, she couldn't bear the frenzied celebrations after all those that had been lost. Diana vowed to finally tell her parents of their engagement. The Duchess still hoped for a more elevated match. The sight of Diana in animated conversation with the Prince of Wales squeezed Violet's heart with anguished expectation. Days of dithering in nervous paralysis followed until Diana's friend Viola Tree took pity on her and offered to tell the Duchess herself. The ensuing scene was as bad as Diana had feared. Her mother's voice echoed through the house, railing against that awful duff and declaring she would rather see her youngest daughter dead from cancer than waste her life on a man of such mediocre character and prospects. Isolated within her own family and choked by her emotions, Diana turned to her old morphine habit for relief. Nonetheless, she could match her mother for stubbornness. As weeks passed, Diana never wavered. If she couldn't have Duff, she would marry no one else. The idea of Diana remaining a spinster was even more horrific to the Duchess than the idea of her being Duff's wife. After a wretched family Christmas, Diana's exhausted parents agreed she and Duff would marry in June. However, the 300 pounds annual allowance her father settled on her was far less generous than Duff had hoped. Despite her parents' disappointment, the British press was effusive. Positive news stories were hard to find that spring, as the post-war recession and the ravages of Spanish flu loaded misery onto an already wearied nation. When the engagement was announced at the beginning of May, photographs of the couple covered the entire front page of the Daily Sketch. On the wedding day itself, the public reacted as though it were almost a state event. Groups of curious and expectant people began gathering in Arlington Street early that morning. By the time Diana and her father left to drive to St. Margaret's Church in Westminster, mounted police had to clear a path through the crowd. The Duke, not in a celebratory mood, was terse. What in the name of heaven is it all about? He protested as their car inched through the throng, seemingly astonished by his daughter's popularity. Thousands more were waiting outside the church, most of them ordinary women who, having followed Diana's activities in the society pages, felt a possessive interest in her wedding. Diana, nervous and reflective, faced the day with a blend of excitement and trepidation, knowing the significance it held for both her personal life and public image. At 26, Diana no longer understood why she was still a virgin. Sexual frustration made Duff quarrelsome, and she acknowledged her resistance to him was timid, even perverse. Her mother had schooled her to believe virginity was a security to be given up only for a wedding ring. Deeper than that belief lay fears of her sexual adequacy. Diana's suspicion that she might be less physically responsive than other women made her terrified of disappointing Duff. A decade later, she would remember her wedding night as a momentous emotional transition. In bed with Duff, she was overtaken by conflicting sensations, nervous, unhappy, and elated feeling, as well as desirous too, and extremely conscious of sex. She felt she had finally become a woman, and that knowledge made their month-long honeymoon idyllic. In March 1920, they discovered a suitable house to rent in Bloomsbury, which would be their home for the next 20 years. Diana began to entertain at Gower Street, 
regrouping writers, painters, musicians, and young politicians into a new version of the coterie. The more wayward guests, like the transvestite Prince Yusupov and Curtis Moffat, Iris Tree's American husband, gave her a pleasing frizzin of modernity, even if Duff tended to disapprove. In 1919, when Moffat dined with them at Arlington Street, Duff was annoyed when the artists not only forgot to dress for dinner, but produced a new wonderful drug, possibly cocaine, which was supposed to produce a thousand queer effects. Set against the Bohemians were their wealthy friends who subsidized the Coopers to an amazingly generous degree. Dinners, theater, and opera tickets, and holidays abroad were offered as a matter of course. In July 1923, when Diana hosted a summer party, it was Max Beaverbrook and several others who paid for the food and drink, while pianist Arthur Rubinstein and singer Fyodor Chaliapin entertained the guests for free. The city was slower to recover its pre-war spirit than Paris, yet nightclubs reopened, shops began to fill, and Diana was once again in the social columns. In his 1922 novel, Aaron's Rod, D.H., Lawrence portrayed her as the arresting Lady Artemis, holding court in a room full of admiring men, smoking her cigarettes, making her slightly rasping witty comments, the bride of the moment. Superficially, Diana had achieved the life she'd fought the Duchess for, but she also wanted to work. Unemployment remained high in Britain as the economy struggled to recover from its wartime battering, particularly among women. In May 1919, women made up three quarters of the unemployed. Unlike most, Diana had extraordinary contacts. Max Beaverbrook first offered Diana a potential career as a newspaper columnist. Women readers were being targeted by the post-war media with a new style of editorial focusing on beauty, fashion, and homemaking tips. Beaverbrook wanted Diana as one of his new circulation-boosting writers, producing regular features for his Sunday Express on subjects ranging from society weddings to the changing length of women's skirts. This seemed a promising start for Diana. Not only did commissions follow from other papers, but in May 1921, she received the offer of a permanent job. The French women's magazine Femina was launching a British edition and invited Diana to become its editor. For an annual salary of 750 pounds, over one and a half times Duff's earnings at the foreign office, she would be required to write one editorial a month, reflecting the magazine's coverage of fashion, arts, and news, and have her photograph featured prominently. The only problem was her inability to feign interest in every new trend in fashion or art. She could never see the point of Picasso. Her writing, while vivid and idiosyncratic, suffered from her lack of formal training in grammar and spelling, and she had even less understanding of structuring an argument. She panicked over every deadline and persuaded Duff to ghost much of what she wrote, including, ironically, her female response to the testy misogyny of Arnold Bennett's Our Women. Diana was also exploring other career options. In 1918, when she made a brief appearance in DW, Griffith's propaganda film Hearts of the World, the director believed he saw potential in her. Her large pale eyes and fair skin were luminous on the cinema screen. When Griffith cast a new Hollywood feature in May 1919, he wanted to use her again, offering a staggering $75,000, or 21,000 pounds. While Diana gaped at the sum, the timing was impossible. Still living at home and not yet married to Duff, she faced a predictable fuss from her parents when she tentatively mentioned the offer. In Britain, even after the war, actresses were assumed to have a colorful reputation. The view that it was impossible for a woman to remain pure who adopts the stage as a profession still lingered. Acting on screen was even more dubious. It had been acceptable for Diana to perform her patriotic cameo for Griffiths, but a commercial film was different. The idea of an aristocrat willingly placing herself in such a context jolted British sensibilities. When Diana made her first film a couple of years later, she received hate mail from disgusted, betrayed members of the public. You thing, wrote one furious correspondent. How can you, born in high social position, so prostitute your status for paltry monetary considerations? Now married, when a new offer came from British producer and director J. Stuart Blackton, Diana was determined to act on it. Blackton hoped to relaunch his career with a new genre of films, period British dramas cast with British stars. Willing to pay a high fee, 
His offer of 12,000 pounds for two films seemed preposterously big. She broke the news to her family with nervous defiance. While there was some reflex protest, she encountered less antagonism than she had feared. Silent cinema was an ideal medium for her debut. There were no lines to learn, and her lack of voice training was not an issue. She assumed all her appearances at costume balls and parties had trained her to look the part of a period character. Even so, when she began to film The Glorious Adventure, it was harder work than expected. The film seemed full of historical inaccuracies, and she particularly minded the portrayal of Samuel Pepys as a pimp. The age of her leading man, Gerald Lawrence, also galled her. She had first seen him playing romantic leads when she was only five. The Glorious Adventure premiered at Covent Garden on January 16, 1922. The press, especially the Beaverbrook-owned Express, praised her performance. Nine months later, when shooting began on The Virgin Queen, Diana was confident of delivering an even better performance. For accuracy, she had to shave off her eyebrows, though she disliked the portrayal and inaccuracies. In the summer of 1923, Diana was offered a role in Max Reinhardt's The Miracle, an emotionally charged story of a young nun saved by the Madonna's intervention. Diana accepted Reinhardt's condition to travel to his Salzburg Schloss for an audition, getting a glimpse of the theatrical profession's cutthroat nature. The experience with Reinhardt was eye-opening. Diana found herself navigating the treacherous waters of professional jealousy, particularly from Maria Carmi, the original star of The Miracle, who viewed Diana as a threat. Carmi spread rumors about Diana's drinking and drug addiction, even cabling to suggest her room be searched for empty gin bottles and needles. Despite Carmi's attempts to undermine her, Diana secured the role. As the time for the American tour of The Miracle approached, Diana became increasingly anxious about being separated from Duff. She liked to claim she was born to be held safely in Duffy's arms, but Duff's numerous affairs, some of which Diana knew about, troubled her deeply. Much later, she would claim that her husband's promiscuity had never really bothered her. Like most men, Duff couldn't have enough. Like most well-brought-up girls of my generation, I was not much interested, she said. But in 1920, when Duff began seeing Diana Capel, widow of Boy Capel, Coco Chanel's former lover, Diana was humiliated. This was one of her friends, and this affair led to one of the worst quarrels of their marriage. She hated Duff for the humiliation and for making her doubt their happiness together. When Diana could approve of Duff's choice of mistress, she tried to affect a benign indifference, but some women caused her profound offense. Daisy Fellows, an expensive, competitive socialite with whom Duff had an on-off affair for many years, struck her as especially repugnant, a silly, giggling, gawky, lecherous bit of dross. What Diana found hardest to bear was her own jealousy. She regarded it as a contemptible emotion, demeaning the modern and exemplary marriage she aspired to. Each time Duff was with another woman, it made her question herself and channel her sexual uncertainties into other physical fears. The miracle opened on January 15th to a full New York ovation with flowers covering the stage and the audience cheering for 15 minutes. The Sunday Express wrote, it is ridiculous for me to try and describe the effect that Diana has on this enormous crowd. She holds them tight, tortures them, frightens them, lifts the whole thing to the sublime. Diana was an intriguing novelty, looking like a contemporary flapper with modern clothes, short hair, and a cut glass accent. Yet she had an aura of old world mystery that fascinated Americans. Duff's professional progress was slower, dependent on her financially, and his political career was still formative. Diana, however, learned to have confidence in herself, Duff, and their unique love. When her mother visited New York, she competed in economizing, taking a spare bed in Diana's suite and boiling rice pudding for supper. Despite their strained relationship, her mother showed interest and enthusiasm for Diana's career, a small yet significant gesture of support. Diana's meticulous budgeting enabled Duff to resign from the Foreign Office in July 1924. He became the conservative candidate for Oldham, a solid industrial town in Lancashire. When the general election was announced that autumn, Diana took a break from her theatrical work in The Miracle to support his campaign. 
Diana's dedication to Duff's political aspirations was unwavering, highlighting her evolving role from socialite and actress to a supportive political spouse. With women newly enfranchised, political wives gained importance, adding warmth to their husband's public image, which appealed to the female electorate. Diana worried she might be too grand and ignorant to be of use. Nevertheless, her presence in Oldham was met with enthusiasm. Promising to perform a clog dance if they voted for Duff, she won over mill workers who mobbed her with kisses. Elderly ladies adored her for extolling Duff's virtues as a husband and potential MP, one exclaiming, there's no swank about her, and oh my, isn't she a beauty? Yet despite her loyalty to Duff, Diana's passion for the theater grew. She reveled in the rituals, dramas, and camaraderie of theatrical life, feeling truly at home among her fellow performers. I was always happiest with the theater people, she admitted later. In 1925, Russian director Stanislavsky called her a great artist, encouraging her to pursue more opportunities, including a potential film role in Germany. Diana studied under a former Stanislavsky student and an elocution coach recommended by John Barrymore. She was offered many projects which she turned down, always wanting to stay in her comfort zone. By the mid-1920s, Diana found solace in the company of friends like Iris Tree, engaging in the luxuries she had once denied herself. Iris leads me to folly, she confessed to Duff, recounting nights of laughter, secret hatching, and pranks. Under Iris's influence, Diana reconsidered her views on fidelity, though her flirtations remained platonic. In 1926, she met Raymond von Hoffmannsthal, a poetic 19-year-old cast member of The Miracle, whose courtship awakened maternal and romantic feelings in Diana. Raymond's courtship was absurdly gallant. Swearing he could never love another woman, he stood outside her bedroom for an entire night while she slept. Duff grew increasingly jealous and weary of their separations, while Diana's letters buzzed with tales of social events and adventures. Whether dining with Condé Nast, attending premieres, or exploring the American landscape, Diana thrived on movement and change. The vibrant experiences in the Caribbean and the southwestern desert further deepened Diana's love for travel. She adored all of it. Writing to Duff about the prisms of hummingbirds and the peacock sea she encountered in the Caribbean. Despite her affection for Duff, Diana found it difficult to stay away from the theater. When the miracle concluded its tour in 1927, she felt adrift. Duff's career flourished with a ministerial post in early 1928, but Diana resisted becoming merely a politician's wife. She continued to host and attend lively gatherings yet yearned for the excitement of the stage. In December 1928, Diana seized the chance to travel to the Bahamas with Sidney Herbert, despite missing Christmas with Duff. Her letters home revealed both the inconveniences and the magical allure of the Caribbean. As the trip neared its end, Diana suspected she was pregnant. Initially panicked, she grew excited, sharing the news with Duff in a mix of jokes and anticipation. Pregnancy brought both joy and fear. At 37, Diana worried about the risks of childbirth. Her fears were compounded by societal pressures and her own desire to remain slender. In addition, doctors discovered she had a fibroid in her uterus. These complications only increased her certainty that she was nearing the end of her life. Diana felt so certain of this that she spent her days in the nursing home leading up to her labor, telegramming goodbye letters to her friends. Nevertheless, on September 15, 1929, Diana gave birth to a healthy son, John Julius. Her survival and the birth were celebrated by crowds, signaling the public's enduring interest in her. She confessed to Duff that she hadn't felt this kind of emotion since, I lost my virginity in your arms. Despite her maternal duties, Diana's passion for the stage persisted. In 1932, she returned to the miracle for a London season and a provincial tour, much to the amusement and concern of her snobbish friends. Offstage, Diana remained a popular and entertaining figure, hosting and attending glamorous events. Cecil Beaton, upon meeting her in Venice, declared that even at 40, she was the most beautiful English woman alive today. Her lips were japonica red, her hair flaxen, her eyes blue, love in the mist, yet the arrival of John Julius marked a shift. Family life and Duff's career took precedence, and Diana gradually withdrew from the public eye. 
The crowds of admirers that had followed her began to disperse, and in private moments, she may have regretted their passing. Yet in contrast to the driven ambitions of her contemporaries, Diana's own impulse towards the stage had always been intertwined with her marriage to Duff, who remained the keystone of her life. At parties, the old Diana always emerged, developing sharp opinions about the respectable guests she and Duff had to receive. For one, she called famous macho writer Ernest Hemingway the greatest bore to end all bores. She even turned her nose up at the former King Edward VIII, the man her mother once considered marrying her off to. In 1952, Diana and Duff Cooper soared close to the zenith of high society, basking in the warmth of their exalted status. That year, the government honored Duff with the title of Viscount Norwich for his services to Britain during World War II and beyond. Diana, however, scorned the title of Viscountess Norwich, deriding it as sounding like porridge. In 1953, Diana's world began to crumble. The Cooper's penchant for fast living and hard drinking exacted a harsh toll on Duff. In May of 1953, he suffered a massive stomach hemorrhage, likely a grim consequence of cirrhosis of the liver. Though he survived this ordeal, Diana, profoundly shaken, took him on a cruise to aid his recovery. Alas, on New Year's Eve, another hemorrhage struck Duff. He lay in excruciating agony for hours as the doctors futilely tried to staunch the bleeding. On January 1st, 1954, Duff Cooper succumbed at the age of 63. During Duff's final hours, Diana, paralyzed by grief, could not summon the courage to bid him farewell, unable to bear witnessing her beloved husband's suffering. Her sorrow was so overwhelming that she eschewed his funeral, unwilling to let the public turn her mourning into a spectacle. Instead, she chose the solace of private grief. Diana lived many years beyond Duff, only passing in 1986 at the venerable age of 93, but his memory never faded from her heart. After his death, she placed a notice in the paper to announce her return to the name Lady Diana Cooper rejecting the Viscountess Norwich title, yet honoring her husband in a way that felt true to her spirit. Throughout her long life, Diana never lost her verve. Her resilience and wit remained undimmed, a testament to the indomitable spirit that had carried her through both the dazzling heights and devastating depths of her extraordinary journey. Diana danced through the decades with an elegance that was as effortless as it was enchanting. Through the trials of war, the throes of passion, and the highs and lows of fame, Diana remained a beacon of resilience and authenticity. Her love for Duff Cooper, her ventures into the theatrical world, and her unwavering sense of self set her apart in a society that often sought to confine and define her. Diana's legacy is etched in the annals of history, not just as an aristocrat or an actress, but as a pioneer who embraced the avant-garde, shattered societal expectations, and left an indelible mark on everyone she met. A woman of wit and wisdom, of charm and courage, who refused to lead the life set out for her, daring to tread her own path. I hope you enjoyed this week's story. Please let me know in the comments your thoughts on the life of Lady Diana Cooper, and don't forget to like, share, and comment. We really need your support. And as always, thanks for watching.